Welcome to Behind the Book. It's time now for Behind the Book. Hosted by Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. Two authors with a passion for books, no filters, and limitless curiosity. Join them now to find out the real story behind your favorite books and authors. And now, Behind the Book. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Book. I'm here with my co-host, Karen. I heard through a uh, bird, a little bird, is that how you say it? A birdie that you have a new novella coming out. I do. It's kind of just a little fun thing I did. I'm going to uh, self-publish it and it's going to come out the beginning of December. It's called Mm -hmm. Wish Upon a Christmas Star. It was so much fun to write. I can't even tell you because the previous book, I love writing in general, but it wasn't flat out fun like this one was. So I hope it reads the way that I felt when I was writing it. And it also really got me in the Christmas mood because Mm -hmm. I was talking about Christmas cookies and about the music and the decorations and snow falling. It got to the point where I would like stop writing for the day and I'd go outside and I'd be like, oh wait, there's no snow. (laughs) I I mean, I I had to like change my, you know, it was like I went through a time portal and I was like, oh, it's no, it's not Christmas season yet. In my head it was. Yeah. Oh, that's funny that you say that because this is the second year in a row that I've written Christmas books in like September, October. And I often put uh, instrumental Christmas music on while I'm writing And I had the same experience. I was like, wait, it's not really Christmas yet. And then by the time Christmas came, I was kind of over it. So (laughs) I don't (laughs) feel like we did it twice this year. (laughs) So that's the only bad thing about writing a Christmas book. But yeah, that sounds great. I can't wait to read it. Um, Is it on pre-order yet or? No, but it will be by the time this podcast airs. So Okay, Um, great. You know, I I know a lot of authors, author friends who have written Christmas novellas and I was always intrigued by it because readers seem to really love them, but they have a short season. I think people read them mostly from like October through January. And so I never, I always thought if I have a good idea, I'll write one. And so I was really tickled when this presented itself and uh, I got to write it. I don't know if I'll ever do it again, but I'm glad I did. And I also really want Hallmark to uh, produce it as a Christmas movie. So just putting that out there. Yeah, oh, I. It wouldn't surprise me. You never know. <laughs> you never. You never um, I you have. Know. I have another little secret to share with our listeners. The other day, I was browsing Amazon, and your book, "The Moonlight Child," is one in the three best-selling books of 2020. Is that amazing or what? It's actually 2021, but it's still I mean, 2021. Yes, it, is, <laughs> it is amazing. <laughs> Okay, that's funny because our guest that you guys are going to listen to soon uh, just was saying how she never knows what day of the week or year it is. And uh, obviously, I am the same way. I think it's an author problem. But when you noticed that my book was in the top three, you sent me a screenshot. And I was I did sort of a weird double take, like, how did she do this? Like, almost like you had created a graphic for me. (laughs) Then I was like, oh, I, I didn't realize that it was that was really super cool. So that's amazing. It really is really a, really a fun thing. And I would have never known if you hadn't sent it to me. So yeah, well, and now I don't even know where I saw it, but I must've been on the bestseller list and it just popped up and I was like, oh my gosh. So of course I had to take a screenshot, but uh, because you know, if you, if you don't have a screenshot, it didn't happen. That's right. My, my kids taught me that early on, picks or it didn't happen. Yes, that's right. Well, I had kind of an exciting week. Um, my fourth Emerson Pass book, The Problem Child, finally released. That was the one I swear, I felt like I it took me forever and ever to write it. It's longer than any of the rest of them in the series, not by a ton, but by enough that it was another couple chapters. And I just thought, when will this book ever end? And I left it on a little bit of a cliffhanger that... I am now going to solve by creating a a book that's coming or a little novella that's coming out on Christmas Eve and that will answer the unanswered thread in the book. So I'm working on that next and that'll be fun. Oh, how fun. I didn't realize when you said the Christmas novella, I didn't realize it was part of the Emerson Pass world. It came to me in a a flash. Your readers are going to love that. 
I hope so. Um, and it has a cute, cute cover. It's called The Seven Days of Christmas, and it is up for pre-order already, uh, although I haven't really announced it much. So I need to let my readers know that they're going to get a Christmas present. <laughs> From Tess Thompson to you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Anyway, well, that's enough about us. We had an incredible guest. Catherine Center is on this episode, and she was fascinating. What a delight and joyful person she, at least she seems to be. She said she's not a hopeful person, which I thought yeah. was interesting. I, you know, I almost called her out on that. I almost said, she said she wasn't optimistic. And I'm like, you sure seem optimistic and your yeah. books make me laugh out loud. So, I mean, I'm yeah. sure she knows who she is and what she's all about, but yeah. that was surprising. Yeah, that was, but it was, a, it's a great interview and a really good one for anybody kind of starting out in their career. She had a lot of great advice. So one of, one of the things she said that I loved is um, she said, practice the art of self-encouragement mm -hmm. that, and I think regardless of who you are and what you do, or what age you are, that's advice we could all use because it's so easy to run yourself down or think about where you've fallen short. But I think we all need that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was, I think that's the only author we've ever had on who said something like that. So I thought that was really neat because uh, I think in general, writers are much more hard on themselves than we should be. You mm -hmm. know, it's like we should be as kind to ourselves as our readers are to us, but <laughs> that doesn't always happen. Anyway, well, that is enough about us. We will let our listeners enjoy Catherine Center. Enjoy the show. Catherine Center's new novel is titled What You Wish For. She's the author of eight novels, including How to Walk Away and Things You Save in the Fire, both instant New York Times bestsellers, as well as The Lost Husband, now a movie on Netflix. She writes laugh and cry books about how life knocks us down and how we get back up. Catherine has been compared to both Nora Ephron and Jane Austen. The Dallas Morning News calls her stories satisfying in the most soul-nurturing way. And the book page calls her the reigning queen of comfort reads. Her books have made countless best of lists, including Real Simple's Best Books of 2020, Amazon's Top 100 Books of 2019, Goodreads Best Books of the Year, the Indie Great Reads List, Book List's Top 10 Women's Fiction, and many, many more. Catherine lives in her hometown of Houston, Texas, with her husband, two kids, and their fluffy but fierce dog. Welcome, Catherine. Oh, it's so fun to be here. Thank you guys for having me on. We are thrilled. Um, all right. So tell us first about your path to publication. Did you always want to be a novelist? I did. <laughs> I did. I didn't always think it was going to work out, but I always wanted to be a novelist. And so from about the age of 12, I wanted to be a novelist. And um, it got started because when I was in the sixth grade, I was super, super awkward. And super, super just kind of miserable, kind of socially miserable. And um, I was lucky because I had two best friends who were also awkward and also miserable. And we got this brilliant idea that we should write novels about the 1980s boy band Duran Duran and that we should cast ourselves as the main characters of the novels. And so we did. And we basically spent that whole school year just writing um bald wish fulfillment themed stories about uh, meeting the guys from Duran Duran and having them, you know, naturally all fall in love with us and then having, you know, many romantic shenanigans. And they, the story, my, you know, we each had a different story going and we politely included each other as secondary characters. My story was genuinely terrible. I still have it. My older sister has instructions if I'm ever like hit by a bus. She's <laughs> like her number one job is to find it in the attic and burn it very quickly so it never sees the light of day. But, you know, it was it's a terrible, terrible novel. It's deeply humiliating every time I go up and try to reread it or think about it. But I also think it was kind of brilliant because I was so hard on myself at that age and I was struggling so hard just to kind of keep my head above water. And um, I wound up writing these fictional stories that were incredibly encouraging and incredibly nourishing. And that I kind of found a way to say all of the sort of kind and encouraging things to myself that I didn't think I deserved to hear somehow. And so um, it became this like sort of magical way of coping 
And anyway, I really got hooked on it. Like once I sort of tasted that nectar, that was it for me. I was like, yes, I want to understand this magic and I want to know how to wield it. And I want to do more and more and more of it. And um, so really from then on, I've just been like totally obsessed with stories and figuring out how they work. That makes me wonder um, what it is about authors that you never want to destroy anything. Because I have a very embarrassing, like it wasn't from childhood, but it was my early 20s. And I kept it until recently. And I, I'm older than you are. And I, the same thing struck me. is like if something happens to me, someone's going to read this. Can be, t- Of course, they put it in perspective that it was an, a very, very early try. But there's something about destroying it completely that's very difficult to do, I think. Yeah, it's uh, I I actually as bad as it is and as humiliating as it is, I also have like a huge amount of affection for that early novel. Like I recognize that it's bad. And whenever I try to go back and reread it, it's like I'm chopping onions, like my eyes just start to sting and water. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what's happening here? But I also recognize from a kind of step back sort of meta perspective, you know, when I think about it in the big picture that actually it's just this sort of little map of this journey that I went on to figure out how to tell stories. I mean, it's a it's an interesting historical record, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad I kept it. But um, but please don't ever read it. I beg you. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've written eight books or eight novels that have been published. If someone's not familiar with your work, is which one do you think they should start with? My first novel that ever hit the New York Times bestseller list was called How to Walk Away. And I think that's a good one to start with. Actually, a lot of people think that that is my first novel. It's actually my sixth novel. Um, but everybody, you know, people are like, oh, I loved her debut. You know, let's see how her sophomore effort goes. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I've been at this a very long time. That's not my, not my debut. I like that one because it's a really good mixture of The thing that I'm always trying to do, which is I'm always trying to write stories that are kind of half tragedy, half comedy. Um, I always try to make sure that there's enough darkness in a story to really define the light. And I try to make sure that the stories have, you know, emotional ballast. You know, I want the main characters to have to struggle with real hard things, genuine grief, genuine suffering, genuine heartbreak and heartache, you know, all that hard stuff that we all have to go through. And um, the way, of course, in my books that they cope with all of that hardship is by cracking like a lot of jokes. So my books tend to be pretty funny. Um, So like with How to Walk Away, you know, when people are like, oh, what's it about? I'm like, oh, it's about a lady who's in a plane crash on the day she gets engaged. You know, and everybody always makes this terrible face of like, ugh. And I'm like, no, no, no. But it's it's funny. It's funny. Um, because, yes, uh, the premise is kind of sad and dark. She's in the hospital for much of the book. But she's surrounded by all these sort of hilarious people. And there's a huge amount of banter going on. And she's got this very wry sense of humor. And so I'm always trying to find that balance between having um, enough hardship for the story to matter and have weight and for the characters to be able to go through something that's hard enough that they can pull wisdom out of that genuine struggle. Um, And also I want the stories to be fun and I want them to be entertaining and I want them to be satisfying and enjoyable and not feel like homework. Um, On your website, in addition to the industry endorsements, you also have quotes from actual readers describing what they love about your books. What made you decide to include reader quotes? I love that question. You know, I love readers and I am a reader and 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 I get so excited when I see other people getting excited about what's going on in the stories. And so I just wanted to include them. That little website of mine, I sort of made it on WordPress because I talked to a professional person about getting a website built and it was so expensive. And I thought I could probably figure this out. So I, I made that little website and I tend to update it. I mean, I'm the one who updates it. And so it's actually such a treat because I get to go to Goodreads and look through reviews and I get to, um, I, I always sort them for like the newest. And then I also sort them for five stars, which is incredibly fun because you are reading all these five star reviews and you're like, wow, people are really loving this book. Like you totally forget that you sorted out all of the fours, threes, twos, and ones. And you're like, just one five star review after another. This is fantastic. Um, so it's weirdly nourishing to get to do that. But yeah, I mean, you know, I feel like, um, reviewers, their opinions matter. They read a lot of books. But I also feel like readers' opinions really matter. What I'm mostly interested in, more than anything, is the opinions of people who like the kind of book that I write. 
right? So if all you like are horror novels and you come and you don't like my sweet little rom-com, that's not super valuable feedback to me because, of course, you didn't like it because that's not your thing. And sometimes that does happen with, like, uh, review publications. There are people who are reviewing all different kinds of books. They're not just reading for pleasure. They're not picking their favorite genre. They're just reading whatever, you know, gets assigned to them or whatever comes across their desk. Um, One of my favorite reviews that I've ever gotten that makes me laugh so much, even still to this day, is for a book that I wrote called Happiness for Beginners. It came out in 2015. It's one of my favorite books that I've done. And it's about this woman who goes on a hiking trip. Um, her life has kind of fallen apart and her annoying little brother talks her into going on a hiking trip. And um, she goes and it's a disaster, but it's a good disaster. And lots of crazy things happen. And she learns lots of wise things about life. And she falls madly in love with someone in the course of all of that. And <laughs> some guy read the book early on there's a hiker on the cover of the book. So I think he thought it was going to be a book about hiking. (laughs) I mean, it kind of is. I mean, there is hiking involved, but it's really much more a story about personal growth and, you know, figuring out how to live your life. His his review that he put up after he read the book, and it was one of the very first reviews to pop up, was um, too much kissing, not enough hiking. (laughs) (laughs) What were you thinking? (laughs) It made me laugh so hard because I was like, wow, this guy is not my target audience. Absolutely not. (laughs) That framework has actually become like... Typically now when I'm reviewing things like just to myself or like to my family or whatever, I'll be like, oh, you know, I liked it, but it was like too much shooting things, not enough kissing. You know, (laughs) always when I don't like something, it's because there's not enough kissing. So (laughs) what I liked about the reader quotes is I... I rarely read a book because of a Kirkus review or a publisher's weekly review. A, a lot of mine are from other readers' recommendations. So to me, that really w- counts for a lot. To me, it does too, actually. And, you know, I meet people all the time at, you know, book festivals and stuff who come up and hug me and we've never met before. And they're like, I just know we would be best friends. And I'm like, you know what? If you like my books, we absolutely would be best friends. You know, we just would (laughs) because we've got the same sense of humor and the same like sort of wry attitude about life. And yes, we would. So a lot of those reviews, when I read them, I'm just like, ugh, I just love these people. Now, another thing I noticed on your website is uh, you have a newsletter called Three Good Things, which I subscribe to. And I actually subscribe to a lot of author newsletters because I, as an author who actually doesn't send out newsletters that often. I, I look to see what I should be doing and who's doing it well. And yours is my absolute favorite. Um, every time it comes into my inbox, I, I think, oh, good. You know, whereas usually you're like, ah, oh, okay, maybe I'll look at it later. How did you come up with the concept of three good things? So actually that book, Happiness for Beginners, um, has a character in it, the main character, Helen, who's like having a hard time with life. And she makes a friend in the story, Wendy, who's studying positive psychology. And Wendy talks to Helen about this idea of like one of the ways you can be happier in life is to try every day to notice three good things that happened that day. And I got that idea from a real book, like a nonfiction book about positive psychology, a book called Happy at Last by a guy named Richard O'Connor. And I thought it was such a helpful idea. Um, And so we started trying to do it. Um, I mean, I put it in the book, but I also put it into my actual life. And I have like a little gratitude journal. And every day I try to write down three good things. Lots of days I forget. Um, It's usually more than three because once you get going, you're like, oh, yeah. And then there was like a gentle breeze that came by. That was awesome. You know, and you start just adding stuff up. So three good things is very much a theme in my life in general. And when I was putting together a newsletter, you know, I was struggling a little bit with the idea of it because I was like, wow, you know, I just really don't have all that much news. You know, like um, I actually have a lot more news now than I did when I started it. But at the time I was like, what am I going to say? Like I took a bubble bath. Like what am I even going to tell people? I decided I I didn't really even want to talk about myself that much. What I what would feel comfortable to me reaching out to people, lots of people, would be to just share good things that I had found with them. And that's what Three Good Things has become. It's it's like I am a person truly, truly in life who falls in love with things. Like I get really excited about stuff. I fall in love with songs. I fall in love with books. You know, I fall in love with Korean dramas that I'm obsessed with. Like I just get really excited about stuff. And when I when that happens to me, which I mean, it's like at least once a day, something, 
Um, I just want to tell everybody about it. And so it's actually been really, really fun and nourishing for me because I, I keep a list on my computer, just a little like document. Where, and whenever I find cool stuff out there in the world, an amazing video, an amazing podcast, you know, I keep a list and I put it all in this document. And then every three or four months when it's time to sort of send out a newsletter, I get to go in and, and find stuff, pull stuff out of the list. And it's just, it makes me feel excited to be reaching out to people because it's like, okay, yeah, I've got some book news. Like, yes, here's some something exciting that's happening. But also this amazing song is going to rock your world. Like, get, like, I'm so excited to share this with you. So it's made it really fun for me because I'm not just talking about myself. I'm also shouting from the rooftops about cool things that other people are doing. And that's easier to do in a lot of ways. And it's also uh, it's also fun. Your novel, The Lost Husband, was adapted for film. And, in, and now Happiness for Beginners will also be a Netflix movie. How involved were you in the process? And were you able to make a cameo appearance? Those are good questions. Um, yes to the cameos. I did get to make a cameo appearance in The Lost Husband. So if you watch it, it's on Netflix. It's super easy to find. Um, there is um, a scene that happens at a farmer's market. And um, there is a lady in that scene who looks like she is suddenly uh, realizing that she cannot act and panicking. That's me. That's me. <laughs> um, it turns out acting is really hard. And I, I was terrible at it. And they had to keep saying cuts. And then I did actually just the other week uh, get to go to... Um, Connecticut, where they were shooting uh, the Happiness for Beginners movie. And that probably won't come out until I don't even know when, but probably fall of 2022, maybe or maybe even later. It's at least a year from now. But uh, yeah, they were filming it. And it was all a little bit crazy because of COVID protocols. But I was able to get to go up there and I was able to get to be on the set. And I got to meet Ellie Kemper, who is absolutely lovely. Um, and I got to meet um, Blythe Danner, who's a national treasure. Um, and I got hugs from both of them, which was pretty much the highlight of my year. Um, you also asked me how involved I was in the movies. Not much. You know, I didn't write the screenplay. I, I just it's not the same because it can't be the same, really. I mean, a novel is 350 pages and a screenplay is about 90 pages. And the rule in um, with screenplays is that one page of script kind of translates to about a minute of screen time, roughly. And so you just can't you couldn't do a 300 page screenplay. It would never happen. So it's never going to be an exact you know, translation of the book. It's always going to be kind of a shrinky dink version where they've kind of distilled it down to the essential elements. And that is absolutely what they did. But but what I was amazed by was, even though it's not the same, and even though they did have to, have to cut out a bunch of subplots and other things and rearrange things to make it work, it still feels like the book. And I think that's the best you can hope for. So yeah, and I will also say that um, I got to watch on the Happiness for Beginners set, I got to watch them doing a scene, you know, kind of over and over, and they were shooting it from all these different angles. And so they would just do the scene again and again uh, as they sort of caught different elements of the scene that they needed. And um, it was funny every single time. Uh, I probably saw them do it 20 times and I laughed, like bent over at the waist laughing every time. Now, to get back to uh, writing novels, which is, I guess is what we should be talking about, but I'm so, I love talking about the movie end of it. When you're starting a manuscript, what part of writing do you find the most challenging? What's the easiest part for you? The easiest part by far, by a million, bazillion, trillion is dialogue for me. I don't have to try to write dialogue at all. It just happens in my head. I just hear it. I just hear people talking and saying funny things to each other. And then I just start uh, writing it down like I'm taking dictation. There's zero effort for me in terms of writing dialogue. What is hard for me, the challenging thing for me always with novels is figuring out the structure of the story. Um, I've read every single book that's ever been written on how to structure a novel because I really, really think that the basic shape, the underlying shape, the, the roller coaster of it is just absolutely crucial for giving people all the emotions that they need to have to have a satisfying read. It's got to build in the right way. You know, the twists and turns have to come in the right places. And it's always really, really hard for me to figure out what that structure is. I mean, I just I struggle with it and I struggle with it and I struggle with it. It always seems like a miracle to me when I've been able to take these 5,000 thoughts and ideas and moments and I've been able to kind of attach them 
to each other in a way that feels linear and has the right shape to it. But it's it, and, and I believe that it's incredibly important. I remember actually uh, going to a, a craft talk on writing with a famous writer who I will not name and asking this person who had won a lot of very big literary prizes about plot and structure and like, you know, what's your system? Because that's the thing I'm always trying to figure out. And she she was like a, a sort of almost like offended by the question. She said she actually said, I don't even like the word plot. Like it was like it was like the idea of thinking about plot felt so insulting, you know, as if a story should just, I don't know, materialize on its own without the writer ever thinking about it. And I just thought that was terrible advice because um, the order that things happen and the way that they build is just vital for the experience of the story. And you know, that it doesn't always have to be the same and you don't have to do it like everybody else does it and you can mess around with it or do things backwards or upside down if you want to. But you need to at least have thought about it. You know, you need to at least understand how the three act structure works and then what you want to do to play with it if you're going to play with it. I noticed in your books, you have a lot of very satisfying endings. Is that something that is easy for you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want the endings to be satisfying. I definitely do not want the endings to be depressing. Like, I feel like my sort of personal Catherine Center guarantee is that I will like never run the main character over with a bus in the final chapter. <laughs> That's just never going to happen. Like, I am not here to make you hate humanity or lose all hope or have to like curl up in the fetal position on the wood floor when the book is over. I actually think it's much, much easier to depress people uh, than it is to help people feel hopeful, right? It's so easy to make people cry. Just write a lovable character and then kill that person. Done. It's like easy, easy. And we're all, you know, we're all half depressed in life anyway. So it doesn't take much to make people feel depressed. <laughs> um, for me, you know, I'm always trying to write the stories that I feel like I need to hear. And it's very hard for me to feel hopeful. I mean, I'm I'm not a super optimistic person, you know? I always feel like I'm about sort of one sort of dirty look in the grocery store away from being like, you know what? We're all doomed. <laughs> <laughs> and so I so part of the reason that I write stories that are sort of warm-hearted and hopeful and and funny and um, optimistic is because I am trying to understand how that works and I'm trying to get better at it myself. You know, I I see stories very much as um, great teaching tools. You know, they give us this kind of remarkable opportunity to kind of do virtual reality for other people's lives, right? And to go through other people's struggles, not just sort of with them, but like as them. You get to step into somebody else's skin and you get to have this kind of extended experience of empathizing with another human being where you get to feel what they're feeling and you get to hope for what they're hoping for and you get to long for what they want. And that's such an incredibly profound feat of the human imagination. I want to harness all of that for myself. You know, I mean, I want to give it to other people too. I feel like writing stories kind of at its heart is really an act of giving. You know, it's, it's like you learn all of these skills and all of these uh, tricks and all of these strategies for telling stories that are meaningful and that feel real and three-dimensional and powerful and, and emotional. And you learn how to do all of that in the spirit of service for other people so other people can pick up that book and feel all those things and go through all that stuff. So it's really something you're doing for others. But the upside is you also are doing it for yourself too. In the process of trying to do something for other people, you get to go into that story as well and you get to stay there and you get to learn all those wise lessons and laugh all those laughs and, and swoon all those swoons and you get to do it too. So I'm writing very much the stories that I would like to read. I very much want to see stories that are hopeful, that are about resilience and that are about, you know, human kindness and finding ways to be better versions of ourselves. And I'm not always good at that stuff in real life. And that's why I'm so fascinated by it. I have this book, um, Things You Save in a Fire, and one of the big, big themes in that story is, is about forgiveness. You know, how do you forgive people who have like really, really wronged you? And, you know, part of the reason that I wrote about that was because I am terrible at forgiveness. I have people I've been mad at since seventh grade, you know, and, 
I'm like, okay, I know that forgiveness is a good thing, but how does it even work? And that story gave me like a great opportunity to like really read up on it and study it and figure it out and think about it. At what point do you share your works in progress? Do you get feedback before you send it off to the editor? And who are your first readers? So I typically, uh, nowadays, and it's kind of evolved a little bit, but I have a really fantastic editor. Her name is Jen Enderlin. She's at St. Martin's Press, which is part of Macmillan. I love her. I'm obsessed with her. I just want to pitch a tent outside her house and throw flowers at her as she comes and goes from her home. She's fantastic. And typically, we talk about the concept early on. You know, I typically give her sort of an outline Um, sometimes the first chapter, she already knows my voice. We've been working together for a while. So she kind of knows what it's, she can guess what it's going to sound like, but she kind of wants to know what are the big elements that I'm going to put together and what's the sort of journey going to be. So we talk about that early on and then I typically go away. I squirrel away and I write and um, it takes me about probably about six months to get a first draft. You know, I feel like writing a first draft is very much about getting very, very quiet right? And sort of paying very close attention to your own compass about what your own inner reader wants to see happen in that story. And so I try to not get a lot of feedback until I've sort of got a first draft that is true to whatever it is that the story wants itself to be. Um, but then once that's done, um, we I send it to my editor and my agent, and then um, they both read it. And then we um, we go back and forth probably three, maybe three times. You know, I mean, an editor is really ultimately just like a really, really thoughtful, really attentive reader. I think there are some people in the world who, I don't know, feel offended or something if people come in and want to change things or alter things or rethink things. But for me, if you've got somebody you trust, you can just be grateful for the help because we all have this common goal, which is to kind of help this story be like the best version of itself. So as you come up with story ideas, do you keep a list or how do you go about that? Yes, I am an incredibly forgetful person. I can't remember anything. I have no idea what year it is as we speak or what month it is, really. Um, I went to the chiropractor the other day on a Monday, and I wished him a happy Friday. So, yeah, I'm uh, very uh, disconnected from space and time in a lot of ways, and uh, I'm super, super forgetful. So I try to, whenever I think of anything good, I try to write it down. I have a big, um, a big long list. It's probably 30 single spaced pages on my computer of just story ideas, things that I come back to over and over and kind of see if they're ready and then they're not. So I just leave them. Um, I've also got files. I mean, because whenever anything comes to me, like even if I'm just grabbing like a crayon and jotting it down on the back of a grocery receipt, I try to write it down. I'd say I'd, I manage to actually write it down or type it into that document probably 50% of the time. Most of it's just like butterflies that sort of flit through your head and and then they're off. And then you're like, oh, what was that great idea? Darn it. It was so brilliant. It was going to change all our lives. And I forgot already. But I do try. I do try because I know that, that I'm not going to remember it. You said some of them, they're not ready yet. What does that mean to you? I think I think of stories as being like in a slow cooker sort of. You just put them back in there and um, they just kind of have to kind of ripen. And uh, sometimes it's about my own life experience getting to the point where I can understand that idea or talk about that idea in a way that's super interesting. Um, I had an idea years ago about a story about a mom and a daughter who had just gone off to college. And it was when my daughter was like five. Uh, And now my daughter has just gone off to college. And it occurred to me recently, I was like, oh, I could write that. I I could write that story now like because I get it now in this new way that I really couldn't have written about it all those years ago. And then I think there's also an element of trying to find ideas that fit well with other ideas. It's fun to have an original idea. But what really matters the most, I think, is that the pieces of the story, like you have like three to five sort of big elements of the story. I always feel like they need to have an energy between them. And so it's like, you know, like when you have two magnets and you try to put the wrong sides of the magnets together and they have that resistance, that kind of force that happens between them and you can't see it, but you can feel that they're resisting each other and there's an energy there. I always feel like for a story to be a really great story, all the pieces have to have that kind of energy between them. And if you start writing and you don't have that energy yet, you're never going to find it. It has to be there from the sort of the ground floor to me. And so there have been times when I've been panicked, you know, and I'm like, this isn't quite right. 
but I just, I got a deadline coming up and I need to get moving. I'll figure it out as I go. And every time I've ever tried to do that, I've never gotten there. The story has never quite lit itself up from the inside. And so I try to be really careful at the very beginning to make sure that that the pieces have this push and pull on each other. And if, if, they're, if it's not there, I don't start. So you know all of that before you even start with page one. Yes. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. I don't know what scenes are going to ultimately wind up in or not in. Um, and there's lots that I don't know about the characters even. But the scenarios, the scenes, the elements, the setup has to be specific. And I need to know, like, OK, so, like, I have a new book. We're, we're going to announce it actually uh, tomorrow that's coming out next summer. It's called The Bodyguard. And it's about a lady bodyguard um, who gets hired to protect this guy. And he, his, his mother is sick and he doesn't want his mother to know that he's that he needs protection. And so um, she winds up pretending that she's his girlfriend around his mother. And so there's this sort of very, very fun um, sort of fake relationship element to the story. And like, as soon as I realized that that was going to happen, I was like, oh, we're good. Like, I know what this story is. Like, I know how to write this story. Um, but you, it's like you need to have these elements. So I knew it was going to be a woman protecting a man. I liked the energy of that. And I knew it was going to be um, kind of a fake relationship where they're kind of pretending for the world. I knew it was going to be set on a Texas ranch. Um, I am from Texas and and my family has a working cattle ranch. So I was excited to set a story out there and I thought that would lend a lot of authenticity to it, which it absolutely did. And then uh, what are the other parts of it? There's probably two or three other elements that I kind of needed to have early on where I was like, okay, when you put all these things together, there's fire in there, you know? And then once you can see that, then you know you're good to go. You know that whatever happens, this story is going to be, it's going to have this energy that it needs. Do you have a book that you would recommend to aspiring authors? Oh my gosh. So, so many. I love craft books. That's like my favorite hobby. Um, Lisa Cron has a bunch of really good books. One is called uh, Story Genius. She's got one that's all about the like neuroscience or cognitive neuroscience of it. What writing advice would you offer to uh, those just starting out? Oh, um, I would say that you should write the kind of stories that you love to read. I mean, just write for love, you know, write for joy. Don't write to impress people. I mean, you do need to impress people a little bit because that's how you get feedback and know that what you're doing is working. But you really want to, like, figure out what your own compass is about what you love. If you love stories about werewolves, you should be writing stories about werewolves. And if you love love stories, you should be writing love stories. And if you love mysteries, that's what you should be writing. And so, yeah, just follow your own compass about what you love to read. You should be writing what you love to read because it's a, you know, writing is uh, it's a great job because you will never, ever get to where you've learned everything in your board because there's so much to learn. But it's also like a job that like once you decide that you're going to be doing this, you have a lot to learn. You know, you have like infinity to learn. And so the way to stay excited about that is to be excited about what you're trying to do and to be excited about the stories that you're trying to bring into the world. Um, So I would say that. And I would also say um, I would work very hard at the beginning. If I could go back and like give my own self a hug (laughs) <laughs> in the Duran Duran years, I would really, really advocate for developing the art of self-encouragement. You know, I think it's really, really easy to be hard on yourself and to think that everything you're doing is terrible. But um, you're never going to show yourself the path of what to do if you're only looking at what you're doing wrong. I think it's really important to be able to sit back and like appreciate when you got something right. There's absolutely no reason not to be like, oh, my gosh, this sentence I just wrote is hilarious. I mean, I write things all the time where the next day I'm like I wake up and I'm brushing my teeth and I think about whatever that little snippet of dialogue was and I start laughing out loud. And I think that's a good thing. You know, I think you I think enjoying the process helps you stick with it. I think you need to be able to, like, tell yourself you're doing a good job and enjoy when you've gotten it right. And I would say pay more attention to what you're getting right. Than what you're getting wrong. Focusing on what you're getting wrong just can't get you there, you know? 
you need to notice when you're getting stuff right and then encourage yourself to do more of that, right? Like, oh, that was funny. I'm going to do that again in a new way on the next page. Um, So yeah, I think encouraging yourself is really, really important. I think it's very easy to quit. If you want to be a writer, there are a million reasons not to write. And the way to keep writing is to love doing it. And the way to love doing it is to be kind and compassionate with yourself and to find joy in it, to actively enjoy it, to savor the good stuff about it, because there's plenty of bad stuff. And that's true for everything in life. Who else has encouraged you along the way? Who's been your biggest supporter? Um, I have two, and they are neck and neck in the race to win. Um, My mom and my husband. Um, have both been incredibly excited about what I do and incredibly supportive and willing really to do anything from taking the kids and driving carpool and, you know, making dinner, anything they can think of to make sure that I get a chance to, to write the books. And they like to read them and they're excited for me and they're genuinely cheering me on. I mean, my mom has known me the longest, obviously. Um, and so she, uh, even as, a, you know, as like a little kid, my mom was thinking I was going to wind up doing something like this. And she's even when I was really um, thinking nothing was going to work out. And there were many, many, many years when I was thinking nothing was going to work out. My mom was just like, you're going to do this. It's going to happen. I didn't believe her, but it was nice that she uh, encouraged me. And yeah, my husband is just like he's like kind of a miracle. He's like a unicorn or something. He's so excited um, about all of it. Uh, he just couldn't be more thrilled and proud and happy. So that that really helps. It's nice because writing is one of those things that doesn't even really seem like it exists. Like my husband's a middle school teacher and you can tell that he has a real job. He goes to work and he deals with kids all day long and he comes home pretty tuckered out. And there are a lot of days when he comes home and I've been like literally in the bubble bath all day long, you know, just like reading romance novels. And he's like, have you been in the bubble bath all day long? You know, and I'm like, dude, this is my job. (laughs) You know, you need people who like who can get it and be like, okay, I guess I guess floating in a bubble bath for a full day is part of your job. And that's that's valid. It is a weird job. If you think of it, ideas in your head become words on a page that somebody reads and it creates a whole immersive experience for them. It's hard to describe what you do in any way that's meaningful yeah. you know I mean because everyone can write and just like we can all sing but no one is going <laughs> to pay to hear me sing but you know what I mean it's there's a difference between doing it to put out there for readers and doing it just in general exactly exactly and being able to say like yeah that counts like I over the pandemic I fell completely in love with watching um, Korean rom-coms and uh, you know so, with some of them they're so addictive um, I would just stay up all night you know, and my husband would literally be getting up for work and he'd be like, are you still watching that rom-com? And I'd be like, once again, this is for my job. Like I'm working. Right now. <laughs> he gets it. Like he's like, you actually are. And I'm like, I know it's crazy, but I actually am. Yeah. So how did you get hooked on rom-coms and how do you watch them? The Korean ones, I mean. Oh, well, um, let me give you the greatest gift that I can ever give anyone and tell you. Um, so there are a ton of Korean rom-coms on Netflix and they have uh, subtitles. And uh, I just highly, highly recommend them. My gateway Korean rom-com was called uh, Crash Landing on You. It is the story about a beautiful South Korean heiress who um, goes paragliding one day in the mountains. And while she is paragliding, a freak tornado comes along. And it flings her over the border into North Korea, where she is discovered by the dashing, devastatingly handsome and morally upstanding Captain Ree, who rescues her and then spends basically the rest of the 16 episode television series uh, trying to get her home to South Korea from North Korea. And of course, they fall madly in love. And it's just absolutely epic. And it's so beautifully done. And it's just swoony and adorable and fantastic. And yeah, I found that one during the pandemic, you know, when I was uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, when I was feeling very freaked out and somehow it got suggested to me and I watched it and that was it for me, like the rest of the pandemic. I mean, I've I've been watching really basically nothing but Korean dramas since then. My best friend loves them too. So now I've got two of you recommended them. I may have to actually check it out. She knows her ironing. Yeah, they're so good. 
Yeah, I mean, the rom-com game in Korea is like, it just puts America to shame. You will never regret it. It's so much fun. So go watch Crash Landing on You. And if and when you love it, shoot me an email and I will give you a list of like 50 more that you need to. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I think this is uh, where we get to the part where we ask our fun extra questions. Yeah. Um, I'll just ask them sort of rapid fire. And if you could just answer whatever comes into your mind. Okay, I'll do my What mind. is one food that will never get past your lips? Oh, uh, s- snails. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help if we call them escargot? <laughs> no? Okay. No, and I have, a, I have a really good friend who knows how to cook them. And she cooks them in like garlic butter sauce and they smell so great. And I'm like, yeah, that's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> who would you want to play you in a movie? Melissa McCarthy. Oh, she's so much fun. I love her. What superpower would you pick, given the opportunity? I would like to be able to heal the sick. What's your biggest guilty pleasure? Oh, do I ever feel guilty about pleasure? Hmm. Um, maybe ice cream, since I know it's not good for me. But I, I tend to be very pro-pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> what is the worst job you've ever had? Oh, I worked as a shipping and receiving clerk in a medical device manufacturing company where a weird draftsman named Ron used to try and give me back rubs. Oh, that does sound like a terrible (laughs) situation. (laughs) If you could instantly become an expert in something, what would it be? Oh, um, dog training. Hmm. I'm only saying that because I just listened to a um, really super fascinating Malcolm Gladwell podcast about how dogs can smell viruses and cancers. If they're trained properly, that would go with healing your sick wish. So those yes! things could just cut you. <laughs> and then <laughs> it's developing. Sort of leads into our next question, too, which is what's your favorite smell? Oh, you know, my daughter for Mother's Day last year gave me this perfume called Baccarat. And um, I think it's the most amazing thing I've ever smelled. And the other day, I went to a restaurant with my husband. And when we got out, the guy who was getting our car for the valet, as he was getting in, he went, oh, are you wearing Baccarat? And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I love that one. I was like, me too, friend. So, um, I don't know why it smells so good, but it really, really does. What is the most terrifying thing you've ever done? Motherhood. And That's I say that good one. <laughs> <laughs> What's one thing you're really bad at? Math. And knowing what day of the week it is. <laughs> I always hate that that's the dementia question. I was just like, (laughs) I think I'm in trouble. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. What's today's date? I'm like, I don't know. No idea. Yeah. Okay. And our final question, if you could live your life over again, would you want to? Yes. I mean, do I just get to keep starting over and over and doing it? You can add any qualifications you want. I mean, yeah, you know, I have a lot of fun. Yes, I would love to just. I mean, I'm not sure what the answer is to that question, but I've often wished that I could have lots and lots of different lives, that I could do one version and then start over and do another version and start over. Of course, I would want to keep all my favorite people with me. I'd have to find my husband in my 20s and then we'd have to like buy a boat and sail around the world, do something different each time. Spoken like a that's true a, novelist. I know. I was going to say, that's a great concept for a book. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> one of us has to write that one. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you, Catherine, for joining us today. It was so much fun talking to you. Oh my gosh, it was such a treat. Thank you, thank guys. Thank you so much for being here. It was really an honor for you to say yes. We were thrilled. Oh, y'all are the best. I loved it. I'll come back anytime. We can hang out okay. in my husband's closet anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> for reference, we have to tell our listeners that that's where you are right now, is that you're in your husband's closet because it was my your quiet... Yeah, my house was very noisy. We needed to find a quiet place for me, so I'm in my husband's closet at the moment. Well, you are welcome back anytime. When the new book comes out, um, we'd love to chat again and hear all about that. You guys are the best. I'm so grateful to you for having me on. It was a treat. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to Behind the Book, brought to you by authors Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and post a question in the comment section. This has been Behind the Book.